Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to another of the FSG's Anti Money Laundering uh, AML Task Force uh, webinars. My name is Graham Gordon, I'm the chairman of the uh, task force, uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to our three speakers today. We've got uh, Dan Johnson, the Vice President of Digital Identity in MasterCard. Uh, Michael Harris, or Mike Harris, the co-founder and head of commercial uh, initiatives in True Native, and uh, Rob Kohatris, the co-founder and president of Digital Identity, or da uh, Rob from Digital, as he prefers to be called in this instance. Welcome, all three of you. Uh, what I'm going to do today is the introduction, and then I'll have the uh, addresses by Dan and Mike and, and Rob. We'll then have a panel discussion. And finally, we'll go to the uh, audience questions. We have some questions uh, already submitted, which we're going to look through at the via a panel session. But then we'll go to questions that you, the audience, wish to ask during uh, the session. Please do, if you have a question, use the, the facilities uh, within the webinar and ask these questions. And we will uh, try our best to address all the questions as they come along. So let me do very quickly. For those of you who have not been here before, talk about the uh, FSG AML Task Force and our purpose. Quite simply put by uh, Sheriff Michael Manelli, uh, it's if post-Brexit and post-COVID, um, we want people to come to the City of London and the UK PLC and do business simply. We want them to be able to open a business account simply and to have uh, valid uh, op operations going forward. But this obviously uh, is hitting up against the AML buffers uh, and our whole intention with webinars and seminars we've had before uh, is to produce a protocol for the financial services uh, organizations that they can follow, which will therefore make it simpler and yet still have the anti-money laundering uh, criteria therein. So that's, that's the simplicity and uh, what today's uh, idea is all about uh, solutions. As you can see for our th previous um, three webinars, we were looking at the issues and the uh, points that have to be considered. And as I say today, we are now looking at potential IT solutions and our three speakers will go through some key aspects thereof and we'll deal with that, uh, the, the solutions at the end. Going forward, and you'll see this TBD dates, we too have been affected by uh, by COVID and we have to be quite careful. We would like to have a round table, which is clarifying the issues. This may well end up as a webinar uh, and it'll be towards the end of uh, October, beginning of November. But uh, if we've clarified the issues that we'll then look at the processes and the changing the culture and how we go forward. And within November, we will then have a seminar or a webinar uh, or, or uh, some uh, part of the both. Uh, where we look at the lessons learned and we come together and we, we produce the, um, the protocol. Our intention is that uh, later in November, December, uh, we will then have the protocol signed uh, and we'll ask members, uh, representatives of the major financial services groups to come along and accept it and take it on board. And all being well, if we can do that in person, uh, the intention at the moment is potentially to do it in the old days. So that's the, that's the AML task force. Um, so watch this space. We're all living in these uncertain terms. And therefore, without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand across to Dan Johnson, the Vice President of Digital Identity at MasterCard. Dan, all yours. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, introduction and thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak to you today. Uh, so um, if I can ask you to go um, straight into the content slides there for me. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk really predominantly around digital identity um, and then illustrate how that is relevant to anti-money laundering and, uh, and and know your customer. Um, so anybody who has looked at identity more broadly um, will understand that there, there is considerable economic benefit to streamlining um, approaches for onboarding um, and also for establishing a relationship with, um, with, with customers. 
Um, so, and that can have a very positive impact on the economy directly. Um, also, introducing more people into not just the financial system, but into the digital economy more broadly. Um, more than half of the world's population don't have a digital identity. And that's not just focusing on third world countries. Um, that is also focusing on uh, first world countries as well. So there are a significant number of people that we might refer to um, as thin file that don't have considerable um, data available about themselves in order to uh, open a bank account or engage in any other digital activities. And so we see it at MasterCard as important to help to establish a, um, a, an identity for those individuals so that they can participate in the digital economy and, um, uh, and, uh, and contribute to the, to the economy uh, more broadly, um, but also be able to access products and services in the way that most of us really take, um, take for granted. There is a significant benefit as well available to organizations that embrace a digital identity and a way of uh, a, a new way of thinking about engagement with customers. So not just significantly reducing onboarding co um, costs, but also then expanding into creating a much richer and more delightful user experience um, in a way that people are becoming more and more comfortable with. Um, uh, people generally nowadays want a, a kind of one tap experience. Um, and, and don't want to be filling in web forms and, uh, and signing pieces of paper and so on. So this idea of being able to establish that you are who you say you are and then engage in relationships with financial institutions and other, uh, other organizations in order to lead a digital life, especially nowadays where our physical lives are being impacted by COVID, um, to be able to interact really simply with organizations digitally uh, we see as considerably important. If you could go on to the next slide for me. Um, we see that there are a number of benefits really to both the consumer and also the financial services. So consumers really want to be able to engage with, um, with, with reduced friction, so they don't want to have to wait a long time to access a product or a service. Uh, they want to be able to get those products and services instantly. Um, and, and part of that is going to be um, being able to establish that you are who you say you are and then reuse that information whenever you're engaging with with, with other organizations. And that can then lead to a seamless onboarding um, uh, service where um, if I want a new financial product, um, I can simply sign up to it or, or, or obtain it um, rather than having to go through a, um, a, a, an application process. And that doesn't mean that we, we're not doing all of the background work that, that's required not just for um, anti-money laundering, but also for product su suitability and other factors that are important in making a decision about onboarding a customer. And that's just part of the problem. The, the other part to solve really is, is one of periodic review. So um, all, uh, individuals who have large numbers of accounts um, uh, with um, one or more financial institutions uh, and perhaps accounts across different divisions, so private banking accounts, retail accounts, wholesale accounts, and so on. Um, when it comes to periodic review, often they're contacted individually by each of those divisions within the bank to provide essentially the same information over and again. Um, if you think about it in the context of um, small to medium enterprises uh, and business owners and also retail banking um, customers, um, it, it has been demonstrated that a large number of SME um, uh, uh, business owners also bank um, from a retail perspective with, with the same bank. It's, it's easier generally to have that, um, have that encompassing relationship. Uh, and in order to open a bank account, you need your passport and proof of address and, and, and other information. Uh, but also to prove the ownership of a company, you also need to provide the same kind of information when you're demonstrating that you are a director of that company. So wouldn't it be good if you could combine all of that information together uh, and rather than ask the customer for that information on a, on a, on a periodic review, um, actually to be able to um, obtain that information once and then share it with multiple divisions within, um, uh, within the bank. Um, the idea really is that that information will be used um, uh, both within the bank and then potentially outside of it as well. So once you've established your identity, you can then um, uh, use that to uh, obtain other products and services, um, which in itself can then start to create um, a, a much richer relationship between the bank and, um, uh, and its customers. Really, this solution needs to ensure that, um, that there is no enormous database of 
personally identifiable information which could be compromised in some way. Um, and so having the individual in control of that data is becoming more and more important. Consumers are becoming much more aware now of how data could be abused. Um, scandals like the Cambridge Analytica scandal from last year um, has really highlighted in consumers' minds the importance of being very, very careful about their data, where it's stored and, and, and who has access to it. And then from a financial service perspective, so having up-to-date information that doesn't then have to be re-reviewed each time. So knowing that an individual um, is who they claim to be, has maintained that identity for some time, does live where they live because they pay their bills at that address and they have um, uh, Amazon parcels and, 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 and posts delivered to that address and so on, all will help to speed up the, um, the review of the customer data and verifying it. Uh, and ultimately create a much more delightful and streamlined um, user experience, which in itself will also reduce uh, reduce costs, um, uh, both for onboarding and also for maintaining that customer that, that customer data, which is becoming more and more important um, uh, in, a, in a kind of GDPR environment where it, where it is essential that that data is maintained and kept up to date and, uh, and, and is accurate. And this also provides an opportunity to uh, to remain stickier with the customer. So you can um, have a much closer relationship, um, provide more personalization, so understand more about the customer. So the customer is sharing more data with you in a in a in a private way, um, so that you can then provide much more in terms of personalization. Make sure that they're getting the right accounts um, and the right services uh, at the time that they need them. And as well, that can then start to reduce fraud. So not just in customer onboarding, but also um, uh, in, in in terms of continuing to maintain uh, that that relationship with that customer. Um, also, through uh, in in terms of reducing fraud, there is the opportunity to share signals. Um, so where there are fraudulent attempts to open accounts on behalf of other people and so on, uh, those signals can be shared uh, in a um, uh, in in a se in a sensible fashion, so again, without building a massive database of uh, of all of this information, um, and um, uh, improving the, uh, the the financial environment and making it safer for everybody. In terms of what's needed, really, um, there is and and has been over the last couple of years um, significant improvement in the way that digital identities are considered within um, regulation and legislation. So the fifth anti-money laundering directive, for example, um, does include provisions for the acceptance of digital identity. And slowly that's making its way into uh, local uh, regulation and legislation. So the joint money laundering steering committee guidance now includes provisions for the acceptance of digital identity. Um, and that's part of the challenge is making sure that that broader legislative and regulatory environment exists. But more broadly, um, uh, there, there needs to be a consideration for utility of, of digital identities, not just in terms of opening bank accounts, but also making sure that those identities can be consumed in a variety of environments. Um, so if we go on to the next slide for me, um, we see that financial services and, and opening bank accounts and income verification and so on are all important. But if you think about it, actually, those are not highly frequent um, uh, uh, activities for an individual. Really, um, people tend to um, open bank accounts uh, and, and interact um, with new services from their financial institution um, uh, actually quite infrequently, um, even though uh, uh, but the process itself um, requires um, significant um, input from the consumer because of the because it's a highly regulated industry. But if you combine that with all of the other products and services that people do consume digitally, so um, shopping and, uh, and obtaining entertainment, and so being able to prove that they are uh, over a certain age, for example, um, accessing government services, um, uh, getting a new job, proving that you uh, have the qualification that you claim to, uh, making an insurance claim, providing health information about yourself, and travel and transportation. All of those services additionally um, help to create a tapestry, if you like, of identity data which can be used um, to demonstrate that a person is who they say they are and have persisted in, 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 in maintaining that claim uh, for, uh, for some period of time, all of which can help with um, uh, anti-money laundering and, uh, and, and knowing your customer. 
Um, if you'd like to, if you can go on to the next slide for me, if you'd like to find out more about uh, what MasterCard are doing in this space, please check out our, um, our portal, idservice.com. Um, and with that said, uh, I'd like to hand over to Mike Harris, uh, who's going to speak to you next. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start with um, a bit of a red tech story that piggybacks off my journey and experiences helping businesses get both the regulatory tick box and the desired uh, great customer experience. I use this to highlight that um, what we're seeing in this industry at the minute is not a million miles from how it was uh, or how it has been for, for over a decade. Uh, it's, it's my opinion that successful red tech requires not just innovation. Uh, but to uh, point that uh, Dan touched on, sort of the regulator openness to change and uh, and industry acceptance, you'll see evidence of this as we move through the uh, presentation. So, uh, in terms of the story, in 2005, I joined a Chester-based data and technology company that had built uh, a business upon providing marketing services and postal address file products. Uh, it it had set up a new business division dedicated to electronic IDV, or what now sits under the AML banner of, of EKYC. Arguably, we were one of the first uh, reg techs uh, to exist. At the time, the Know Your Customer compliance process employed uh, in financial services involved the capturing of physical proofs of identity uh, and proofs of address, for example, bank statements and utility bills and, and driving licenses. The customer experience compared with the slick Revolut style of onboarding um, was painful. Getting certified copies of documents, visiting the branch or sending passports via the, the post and hoping they would get returned in time for, for the holidays. Uh, back then, it was only the credit reference agencies that were providing EIDV. And our view was that this approach to EIDV was, uh, was slightly flawed and limiting the customer experience. Because unless you had established lines of credit, or if you were a fraudster that had engineered a credit file with false documents, you were not going to get accepted. Uh, our unique solution at the time not only used credit header information, but a range of other data sources, such as utility data that we had access to and could be used to improve the chances of verifying a consumer's identity. Um, but having the data and technology was uh, just a small part of the jigsaw. And as is the case now, and once again, as Dan's touched on, um, innovation can be constrained by regulation and legislation. Uh, businesses cannot adopt a, a new innovative vendor until they are comfortable that the regulators support their methods and they're not left exposed to the regulatory fines. Uh, in recent years, we have seen regulators around the world introduce a sandbox environment where such testing of new ideas and innovation can be implemented um, without causing uh, concern or exposure in terms of the uh, compliance requirements. Um, so this need to work with the regulators um, was evident. And at the time, that drove us to work closely with JMLSG. And um, we were advising them on what was possible with EIDV and the limitations of what had gone on before. And as a result of uh, lobbying, uh, when the uh, 2006 guidelines were released, they did include instructions on the use of electronic verification. So this, this is mirroring exactly what Dan's just touched on in terms of uh, latest guidance reflecting uh, uh, use of digital identities. So following that time, EIDV became more widely accepted as a means for better digital onboarding and a route to a better customer experience. And since then, uh, there is a, a global world of EIDV providers, as, uh, as you uh, are likely aware of. Um, five years, well, it's about five years later, uh, Gartner, the industry research organization, published a white paper promoting a laid approach as best practice to onboarding customers and preventing financial crime. Um, this described using multiple vendors solving niche problems across the life cycle of the customer journey. So, not just onboarding, but downstream, preventing uh, things like account takeover, for example. Uh, and this is also touching on the use of things like document authentication as a step-up process for improving online accept rates after EIDV um, uh, may have 
fail to identify that particular uh, individual. Uh, we'll look at this in more, more detail shortly. Uh, and in fact, it was the, the, the Gartner view and recommendation in terms of best practice that uh, really led to a true narrative vision and uh, ultimately our incorporation in, in 2016. So this all brings us up to current date where digital transformation is driving a need for, for a reg tech or reg tech that supports best customer experience that can help um, financial services win business and as a minimum, not lose business, which is a, a key part of the, uh, the ROI. Uh, and in fact, we've recently seen Gartner now identify the, the true narrative AML orchestration approach uh, for technology as the latest, one of the latest market trends in this area, which like a decade ago, we expect will drive acceptance um, in the market. Uh, if we can move on, please. I'll just let that one uh, animate. So um, if looking at the Gartner layered approach in, in more detail, you'll see it's very typical of what we see in many businesses today. Lots of integration um, with vendors, um, so vendors with niche solutions that, that can serve use cases along the journey and the customer life cycle. Uh, as a consequence, lots of billing points and so lots of vendor relationships to maintain. And uh, more often than not, multiple case management systems that are presented to help resolve referrals or uh, manage the alerts that these vendors uh, generate across, uh, across the course of processing. Uh, however, when it comes to customer experience, this approach is slightly constrained by a reliance on IT and the departmental silos it creates. As a result, this reality is often more about the firm having the right defenses in place for risks they're exposed to rather than having a positive impact on the customer experience. For financial crime departments, less control and limited flexibility become an issue when needing to adjust for new regulation or trends. The current pandemic has exposed this as IT departments have, had, have been consumed by the urgent changes needed to be made to enable working from home, for example. Uh, furthermore, it's difficult to get a holistic picture of the money laundering risk where you're when you're operating in silos. And it's harder, to st harder still to implement some of the fifth money laundering directives uh, and the requirements for dynamic risk rating across the customer lifecycle, where you're detached, you're onboarding with your ongoing account monitoring and your transaction monitoring. And uh, so next slide, please. Considering these limitations, the true narrative approach is a platform accessed via a single API and built to enable the layered approach without the reliance on uh, IT development and resources. It uh, presents itself without multiple case management, so everything's in one place, and without the need for multiple vendor relationships. In fact, everything is in one place. It becomes a, a one-stop shop for financial crime management. Um, so this no-code technology includes all the leading global data providers for AML integrated into a platform as a single marketplace of enrichment and insights for both B2C and maybe more relevant for this audience, B2B use cases. Um, the, the rules engine, for example, designed for business user rather than IT. Uh, as a consequence, compliance managers and fin crime teams can take control building unlimited strategies for customer journeys in a way which can promote the optimum uh, customer experience across all products, jurisdictions, and risk profiles. Just as important is its ability to manage a change in strategy in the future. Final slide, please. So it, in my experience, you can have the regulatory tick box, which you can afford, uh, cannot afford not to have and also the RegTech to create great customer experiences, either directly with each customer interaction or and indirectly by optimizing the cost savings and passing them on to the customer. So in summary, the results are likely to be an increase in business through um, on-demand access to a breadth of data and services and insights, which enables high levels of automation. 
uh, and therefore successful customer acquisition, which leads to reducing the customer dropout. We also have reduction in cost of, uh, cost of acquisition. So with greater control and segmentation regarding AML strategies and customer risk profiling, the ability to adopt the true risk-based approach. So you're only checking what you need to check at the right time at the particular interaction. In terms of reducing operational costs, the automation that the, this approach, this orchestration approach uh, lends itself to means that there's a reduction in uh, manual resources and because the business is in control, a reduction of IT change requests. So this is enabling business stakeholders to make their own changes and consequently maintain um, uh, headcount, reduce headcount. In a similar vein uh, for reducing false positives, having strategies specific to customer segment and risk profile and providing more insights and a holistic view across all the steps in the AML process lends itself to greater accuracy in decisioning, therefore reducing the false, uh, false positives. And then in terms of protecting reputation, um, I'm not sure about you, but when talking to prospective customers, they always have a competitor or business in mind that they aspire to with respect to things like their onboarding process. So Revolut, for example, always comes up as a, we would like a, a, an onboarding process similar to that. And customers think the same way, positively referring these experiences across their peer groups. And in addition, robust defenses against financial crime, um, it's, it's known to the money launderers and fraudsters, they share this information. So by having a robust approach drives their activities to the firms who are less prepared and, and have the less, less uh, robust um, uh, defenses in place. And then finally, reducing the financial crime. Well, naturally, with a tick box in place, you get to address the most important challenge of reducing financial crime. And this is by having access to the latest and greatest innovations for detecting and preventing um, financial crime, be it money laundering uh, or fraud. So to conclude, RegTech has been helping to improve the customer experience for over a decade. We now have many innovative RegTech solutions. Now is the time to use technology to bring them together in a seamless way without compromising on user or customer experience or the future need for change. And clearly we need all need to be prepared for change. Thank you. I now hand you over uh, to Rob from Digital uh, Identity Next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to all of you for taking some of your valuable time uh, to talk a little bit with us today. Um, the area that I'd like to uh, focus on has been touched on, um, perhaps even more than touched on, uh, in the sessions that you just heard. So you'll be picking up a, a recurrent theme, which is in order to improve AML and, and get the uh, balance between AML and customer experience, we need to solve the digital identity problem. And I've called my talk, Changing the Game, Empowering Our Customers, Empowering Citizens uh, with an Assured Digital Identity. And this is a, a societal function uh, and also an economic function uh, that we think the uh, financial services community uh, needs to participate in. I'll say a little bit about who I am and why I believe that and run a few slides with you. Uh, it should take less than 10 minutes and welcome your questions. What I'd like to suggest to you is that we are at a crossroads. We're entering a, a new type of economy, not just a, a new normal as it's being called, but a economy that is much more digital than it's ever been. And yet we haven't solved some systemic issues that are actually undermining uh, the UK economy in particular, but you could even argue the global economy um, Dan was, for example, talking about how many people don't have a digital identity and therefore don't have access uh, to financial services uh, easily or readily online. So an issue of accessibility is certainly the case. But with a large number of people in the UK with financial uh, products already, bank accounts particularly, uh, what can we do to improve their world, their lives and stay relevant? And specifically, how can we 
reduce fraud and friction. And I'll see if I can explore these themes. A little bit about me, first of all. So I'm Rob Cotlantz. Uh, for those struggling with the name or its origin, uh, anybody who's been following the Battle of Britain um, centenary or celebrations of the last 80 years, um, my father was 308 Squadron, one of the Polish flyboys, and he flew with uh, some of the aces of the Battle of Britain. And uh, the family has stayed. And we have a, a pride in the fact that Britain has accepted us and we really want to give something back. And to that end, um, I built a series of different companies, but most notably one in the Swift domain space, which we marketed out um, on NASDAQ and sold to bottom line technologies for a little bit over $100 million. And uh, once we'd done the Swift payments uh, stuff, it became clear that, that identity would be a great challenge. And I co-founded the company, I'm a significant investor. We have today 30 uh, largely angel investors and a, a model that uh, is really designed to preserve uh, the independence of the company and to provide societal value. A number of our board directors uh, include Shuka Amuna, who's come out of parliament. Many of you may know was shadow, uh, ex-shadow business secretary. Um, a number of ex-bankers on our board, Martin Wilson, who's just taken over the role of CEO, uh, as well as a number of fintech entrepreneurs like myself, Nick Hill and various others uh, that uh, have worked with Apple and a number of other key players in the industry. I won't lay rich, but a little bit of background. We'll move to the next slide. So the context I'd like to suggest to you is that Britain might actually be slipping behind in, in the digital space. And you're going to say, well, I don't accept that. We're a leader, but actually we're a follower and perhaps even a laggard in the area of providing identity services to consumers to make their lives easier, to empower them digitally and to solve many of the issues that uh, the earlier speakers were talking about. Uh, Lord Blunkett, for those of you that remember him, um, just put his name to a paper on the levels of increasing fraud because due to COVID, we've all moved online. That seismic change, that significant change in society uh, means, according to that paper, we would expect to see around about a 4.6 billion a sterling increase in, in fraud. Um, you may know that um, already the tax office has reported 22,000 companies that they're having a look at, 22,000, um, because they believe there are irregularities in some of the payments that they received. At the heart of these problems is, is how difficult it is. Um, as the internet was not built with an identity layer, a personal or corporate identity layer, to actually get the services you need quickly and easily. That's frustrating consumers. And on the next one, we're seeing substantial financial losses. Now, in the challenger bank space, um, organizations who mentioned Revolut several times, but Monzo, Starling and others have been trying to create better digital onboarding experiences. And indeed, the big banks uh, have been trying to follow that, too. Um, but the problem runs much, much broader across our economy. It's not just about digital reintermediation and relevance, we think, for our banks and, and meeting societal changes. It's also for our broader economy. Our retailers are being caned by the likes of Amazon, and that will have, I think, long-term uh, impacts for our economy as we move essentially uh, to the risk of being a, a subsidiary of some very substantial American companies, big tech businesses that are growing at phenomenal rates. And we have to ask, I think, a question, is that we want uh, what we want for the, for the UK economy? How do we restate the preeminence of London as a financial capital. And I'm going to argue that we can only do that by financial institutions getting behind an imperative to sort out the digital customer experience with digital identity. Let's see if I can move to the next slide and try and build on some of this. I'll just give a simple example of, uh, of a problem we had at Digital Identity Nudge. Uh, we chose one of the top five banks as our bank uh, a couple of years back. And as we did that, we went through what I can only say is the, the worst type of, of, of what they tried to make a digital onboarding service. I won't may mention the bank, but we've had to fill out lots of forms. And, and really, although I've been with the bank for, for over 30 years, I, I felt almost like a terrorist rather than somebody really wanting to put the investor's money in, a, in that bank account 
and, and start to pay suppliers and, and hire people. We got past the problem, but I can tell you that uh, we had to escalate a, a customer service dispute. The onboarding process was absolutely horrible. And th th this isn't the type of experience that I think one of our major banks should be providing to SMEs and, uh, and, and uh, startups like ourselves that, that have raised several million in, in investor funding. So we've clearly got a range of issues for the SME and for the consumer. Our approach is to um, understand how we can work with the community and build out an ecosystem as an independent company. And to that end, we've consulted quite significantly with players in government that are trying to create identity standards. Um, the uh, key players at UK Finance and the JMLSG that define regulation in this space, um, some of the payments players, Pay UK, uh, and various other organizations. And the consensus that we get to is yes, we've got to solve digital identity, but how are we going to do it? And what we fail to do is to come together in a collaborative spirit and say, we can actually work together as a community, as a community of financial services technologists and entrepreneurs and financial institutions, and define the standards, the specification and the framework to allow the data that consumers have to be used to underpin digital trust and enable the digital world. I'll move to the next slide. How have they done this elsewhere? What learnings can we take uh, from other markets? Well, uh, identity services are across the Nordics not regarded as an issue. AML in general is not regarded as an issue. And banks have saved an absolute fortune, several million or maybe even hundreds of millions over a number of years in establishing identity partnerships and constructs. The bank ID product is a one ID. It's a de facto way of proving you are who you say you are all over the place. You can do it if you're buying an airline ticket, if you're looking to switch an energy company, if you're looking to onboard to buy a mortgage, either from an institution you're already with or a new institution that you wish to buy from. It's simple and easy. You use your login of your bank. And these products are now so highly successful um, across the Nordic markets. They're being copied in Germany, which is the very me product backed by Deutsche Bank, and the It's Me product in Belgium, which is a digital identity product backed by all the leading Belgian banks and, and telcos. Our vision is to create a similar product for the UK, working in partnership with the industry. And we've made significant progress on that. And specifically to enable a product of that type, you have to have some technology. So we'll go to the next slide. So we are currently proving out the value proposition in a pilot program with a number of large financial institutions. Uh, but we are completing the build of a platform that allows data to be exchanged from the bank out into uh, sectors of the economy that have big problems with identity. They extend from mobile operators right through to supermarkets. We've seen significant moves towards digital adoption. Uh, pure play organizations, insurance organizations. And our vision is to allow this to be simple and easy for consumers to leverage the data they've already got held about them in key places such as their banks, empower those consumers, underpin the digital world uh, with the financial services industry, re-intermediate the digital world. Let's not leave this to Apple or Amazon or Facebook to seize control of the digital relationship, our vision is to build a community of trust. And we've made some significant progress, but I'm really very keen to hear from the audience as to what they believe the issues are. So if anybody's interested in a little bit more about us, please go to my LinkedIn profile, um, ping me a note. Um, otherwise, I think it's over to the panel. Right, thank you. Uh, just make sure I'm not can't hear you Graham at the moment can you hear me now can yes. excellent Sorry, uh, we're going to uh, address a couple of these questions, but a significant number of questions come in from the audience. So I'm going to go straight to those 
uh, once we've, we've done one or two uh, points. I, I, a couple of the questions we've got down here actually have been uh, mirroring some of the questions that come in from the audience. So I'm going to go to those first, if I may, and try to get a broad spectrum from uh, the panel of how they feel. Uh, given the legacy system, so this is something you were just talking about uh, a few moments ago, Rob, and, and the, the uh, attempt you're trying to get to, to the banks to, to adopt the Nordic type system. But given that a lot of our uh, legacy banks, we've been referring to them, have uh, most a lot of their data still in the PL1 K, uh, and uh, COBOL and Fortran and all the rest of the things that I, I learned back in the early 70s. What is the what is the, the probability or the likelihood that we can actually get them to this system, uh, to the new process system? What's your opinion of the low hanging fruit that we can grab straight away and get some results from? Thank you, Graham. Um, well, I'm. I think everybody on this call will be familiar with um, regulatory initiatives uh, that have been uh, developed by the FCA and various other actors in the market. But I guess the most notable of this is, is open banking, uh, where financial institutions are, are already rendering data, but but without a commercial model, and um, so they're being forced into doing it rather than wishing to do it because there might be a commercial upside and a benefit in providing that data to the broader economy. So I think we're already seeing some evidence um, that open banking will set a standard. There is a move towards uh, open finance, as I, I think many people will know. The regulators are currently looking for consultation uh, from government on open finance. And I think we'll see some of the principles of, of data that's already available being extended across the broader economy. And the government also has a smart data initiative uh, on which they published recently. I think this all underpins a key a real point, which is for the UK economy to uh, be the success we all want it to be and for financial services to benefit significantly from that and help power that. Uh, we are moving towards what might be termed an open data economy and our government is taking us down that road. So APIs, technology already exists to do some of these things and what we haven't seen yet is the building out of that architecture that enabling open data architecture to build and power the 21st century digital economy that we need and i'm quite convinced that we will start to see it companies like us are involved in projects to do that and ultimately we will empower citizens together uh, to do things faster quicker and cheaper for all of us and, and to, to lead uh, Europe as the major digital economy. Our consumers love to do digital. Uh, we as an industry, I, I think, need to do it better. And that will save us a lot of money in AML costs, Graham. Moving from there, just Dan, just ask you with, with your sort of your master hat, master hat, master card hat on um, and following on from what Rob was just saying. Yeah. Look at the banking and the financial services needs and moving to the, the, the digital age, how do you do that? Because you talked about those people who are not uh, digitally, uh, don't have a, a proper digital uh, thumbprint yet. How do you move them uh, into the digital requirements? How do you retain those customers going forward? They may have a MasterCard, but they don't have you know, a real digital footprint. Uh, yeah, it, it is certainly a challenge. And, and really the thing to do is to start to look at uh, how to satisfy existing regulation and legislation by looking at new and novel data sources. Um, so, for example, looking at uh, housing authority data. Um, so there are lots of people who are, you know, on the on the breadline, um, but still contribute to the digital economy. They they have a digital presence, um, and they also interact with a number of organisations. So perhaps instead of um, looking at uh, credit reference agency data plus um, uh, utility bill data and, and, and so on to start to look at broader data sources um, to help to uh, onboard these these customers and, and obviously that in itself is not going to address absolutely everybody there are people that um, uh, uh, don't even have um, th those kind of sources of data but really a kind of exploratory into um, uh, these these additional data sources to help to um, uh, provide financial services and other digital services to um, the, the digitally underserved. 
Okay, uh, and Michael, if I may, just again following on from there, something you said. You know, we, we, we're talking about the KYC, you know, the, the onboarding, if you will. But then there, there's a big technical uh, solution you were referring to about the the ongoing monitoring uh, aspect. Now that that seems to be almost forgotten at times. And can you sort of talk about you know, what what is being adopted? Where is the where is the the solutions going? Yeah, so so there is an advancement there in the last uh, last two years. Traditionally, you do the ongoing monitoring. You would uh, batch up your customer database, and send it off to a supplier, and they would do the screening and return results. Uh, so operationally, it's very cumbersome. Um, there are um, reasonably recent entries to the market. So organisations like uh, vendors like Comply Advantage, who take a more proactive uh, approach to monitoring whereby when you onboard a customer and screen that customer, you then have the ability to toggle on or off the need to monitor that the customer. And what they use is a, a sort of proactive alerting that comes back into the compliance team to review as and when there's a change of status. So rather than waiting six months to find out if you've actually got a, a terrorist on your, on your books, they'll let you know as soon as there's a, a change in terms of what's being listed in terms of the, the, the customer base. Um, okay. Yeah. Can, so, can I, yeah. So, can I, I'm conscious. I want to get on to the the, the questions from the the uh, audience, if I may. Uh, and just it, it, something goes from there. If one, just uh, you were talking about the uh, the onboarding, and we were talking about the continuous trail. One of the the, the questions. I mean, there was a question about the the Nordic system, which Rob very kindly answered almost immediately thereafter. But one of the things, yeah. Going online and doing the KYC online and monitoring online is fine, but at the moment everyone still comes back to a piece of paper that a wet signature. Now, the the, the uh, a number of uh, people have talked about why don't they use DocuSign or other? Yeah, you know, they mentioned other um, systems. What? Where do you feel, Rob? The the, the situation is going to go as far as signing, you know, getting a, an appropriate digital signature that. Uh, banks in particular, but financial services as a whole, will accept. So, Graham, um, it's a small world because uh, we have a webinar at four today, which I'm not aggressively promoting because everybody on this call will be too busy uh, to attend. But for those that are interested, it, it's with DocuSign. And DocuSign is a partner in our project. And what they're looking to do is to marry the identity to the digital signature. Um, now, that already happens in the Nordics. You, you identity sign, if I can use that phrase as a sort of working title. So identity enables you to automate processes that would otherwise be paper based uh, so that you could sign somebody for a mortgage. Uh, but if you're using a single digital identity, the whole of the trail of the mortgage, including conveyancing, for example, the legal work that needs to be done, the land registry work that needs to be done, the various agencies in that process uh, all know you are who you say you are and you don't have to keep reapplying you, you can also um with the services automate direct debits where there's a lot of fraud in, in manual signature at the moment um and uh, this is a, another really strong use case for for the financial institutions again with a identity sign with a docu sign with identity so that is a, a piece of work in process at the moment yeah. brand the, the one question that sort of follows on from there from, from the audience is it, what is the panel's view of digital identities issued by third parties for use by financial services? And they say, e.g. Yoti, rather than the service providers themselves creating it. I mean, uh, given that you're in that field, can I ask Dan to ask, answer first, then I'll, I'll come to the other two. Uh, I, I think that's absolutely relevant. I mean, there really does need to be consumer choice. I mean, clearly MasterCard are working on an identity service, and so we would love for everybody to sign up to that. Um, but we recognize that, you know, that there are going to be other identity services um, a, a, out there. And so what's really needed is a is an interoperable identity um, a capability rather than a platform, um, which will allow individuals to take their uh, identity created through some other um, party uh, and then use that um, uh, to open a bank account or to um, create a new shopping account or to access some content um, and, and, and so on. So um, I, I do think that uh, and we uh, do think that it is it is imperative that there is that consumer choice 
um, and that individuals are not necessarily locked into any one specific provider or, or technology or platform. Okay, uh, and Michael? Yeah, the, the, the two challenges I see are the, the critical mass. So you, you will need multiple um, third parties to, to get that critical mass. Uh, but that, that could actually be a divide and conquer uh, outcome. Uh, and I think the, the other challenge in, in that regard is actually the enrollment onto those services. So it comes all the way back round to how can you be sure the person who's role, enrolling for that service is who they say they are. Uh, so, so it becomes a, a, a continuous loop, uh, but um, I, I, I can see there being, or there are growing numbers of services like OT that are, uh, are being developed. And um, I, I think it is the, um, sort of the, the critical mass which will make one more successful over the other. Okay, and Rob? I think Yoti is a great example of a, a truly entrepreneurial company. I know Robin, the CEO personally, and, and I think that what they're doing in bringing identity services to the market is to be highly commended. Um, but I, I don't I don't see um, companies like Yoti uh, being able, unless we all work together to support standards and, and provide data from financial institutions, being able to effectively compete with, with the, the gaffer, with the large technology companies. So for those of you who haven't seen it, Apple have filed patents for a digital identity network. Apple are hiring a head of digital identity for Apple Pay. Uh, they bought a, a point of sale vendor for 100 million out of Montreal. Uh, they are looking to automate payments on the digital phone right through the process. Let us hope they wish financial institutions still to be part of that process, but they're big enough to take us out if they want to, or some of us anyway. I think that the key point I would say is in the area of identity, Graham, the big tech are seeking to play in a space that we should, as a financial services community, be owning. And if that happens and we lose control of the digital customer relationship, well, it shouldn't have happened on our watch is all I can say, Graham. Okay, again, moving on from there, uh, one of the questions, uh, I'm, I'm pricing a, a number of questions here, actually. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, um, not loose, by the FSA Tech Sprint about the privacy enhancing technologies. So what is the panel's view uh, on the development and adoption of, of PETs? I'll, I'll start with Michael this time, if I may. Hey, Graham, you have to move on. I don't have an opinion on that one. <laughs> OK, well, Dan? Uh so privacy as a um, as a whole, I think, is of critical importance. Um, it is something that um, uh, has been lacking in uh, particularly when we get into the large tech companies looking at um, uh, identity and services more broadly. Um, uh, I do think that, um, you know, we, we should certainly pay attention to some of the work that um, some of the large tech companies are, are, are doing. Um, uh, Apple, for example, uh, do have a privacy centric business model um, which uh, w which is which is particularly helpful and I think I think relevant and right um, some of the other companies so I'm not listing them specifically uh, haven't really started from the right the right the right point uh, and with the right principles um, so um, treating consumers as the product and their data as the product so that um, so that they can then consume and monetize that data. Uh, I don't think it's the right it's the right starting point, and it's certainly not one of the core principles of a digital identity ecosystem. Um, so I, I I think that more focus on privacy, uh, respecting that privacy of individuals, and uh, and creating an environment where the individual is in complete control of their data, who has access to it, and, and where it's stored. Uh, I think is of, of, of paramount importance and, and maybe probably the most important principle of all. Okay, Rob. I would add to uh, and endorse many of the things that uh, particularly Dan was saying at the end of that, uh, everything has to respect privacy and everything has to be built a privacy by design was a common phrase that, that we use. It's part of our uh, vision and solution. Uh, but I, I would call out something without naming specific tech vendors that might or might not be American based uh, and just say, I think it is an outrage uh, that they've been allowed to abuse customer data for so long without regulatory in intervention. Uh, I think 
both the Association of, of, of Malicious and False Identities, which run to hundreds of millions, the fact that their products log in with have become very popular with the under 30s. We should not, I think, as a community uh, have allowed this to happen. And I'm glad to see the British government starting to recognise that there's an important regulatory role as well as the European community in managing these companies so they do not abuse personal data. Sadly, some of them have been so doing. Okay, now, um, changing slightly, uh, one of the questions is app fraud is a big issue in the UK. However, the bank account is used to receive the fraudulent funds and is known. So why can't the funds from the fraudster be traced to the account? Has anyone got any uh, results on why can't you basically trace the fraud, fraudster who's transferring money from your account to their own account? Any concept on that? It's a fairly uh, specific question. Uh, Rob, Rob you look like you're going to jump in, so I'll let you well, do so. I think you know a lot of work has, has been done with products like confirmation of payee, uh, which are supposed to help the person making the payment know where that payment is going. Um, and you know, obviously, that's a UK-based product. Um, uh, it, you know, I think it's had some level of success. It gives consumers a lot of confidence uh, perhaps if they're sending a payment to be able to check that that you know that is a supplier that or a um you know somebody's coming to do some work on their house or whatever and and that payment is going to that person's account and so i think we have made some progress in this area but i don't think that it it, it reflects the internet the international community hasn't made that level of progress so if you talk to the american financial institutions as i often do uh, you find that there's, there's a huge amount of, of fraud that they're trying to prevent, particularly in digital payment products, where um, you see gangster merchants, as we might call them, uh, that appear to be selling you something, but it never arrives, but they've got the money in the bank account, and before too long, they've disappeared. Uh, I think this is a problem that probably has to be dealt with internationally, but I do believe in the UK we've made some steps in the right direction. I think. Pay UK and others who've, who've implemented um, confirmation of peace, uh, pay ECOP with the leading banks are, are to be credited for, for, for that important step in the right direction. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, uh, we're, we're coming to the towards the end, but there's a couple of uh, questions I'm, I'm going to put to you, mate, so to, to sum up a bit. Um, I'd like you to think, in five years' time, this is for, for each of you in turn, in five years' time, where would you personally like the customer onboarding journey to look like and uh, do you think it will look like that or um, is there something else bearing in mind uh, as I think uh, one of you mentioned earlier we are um, now five years ahead of where we would have been had COVID not happened as far as electronics and online is concerned um, so where do you think you're going we're going to be in another five years and I'll start, uh, with, I'll start with you, Rob, as we've just finished with you, and then we can move through the other two. I, I'll summarize it in a few words. Um, tap, tap, and you're done. Tap, tap, and you're done. Or as Visa call it, click to pay. Sorry, Dan, because I know Visa would be a direct rival, but I'm sure you've got another similar wonderful product. So I think we need to be at a point where we can onboard the consumer and they can make a payment you need the merchant to know they really are who they say they are. And that payment can be made with the full choice by the consumer. They can put it on a car. They can pay direct from bank account. It needs to be frictionless. It needs to be simple. And it needs to not be fraud. And I think we're not that far away from it, Graham. It's just about the community coming together to get that done. So you think this will, will be possible within the five years? Well, if we don't do it, Apple's going to do it. Okay. And then what role do we have? We, we need we need to establish for ourselves, you know, is that a, an ecosystem that we can maintain with big tech or, or are they going to start to invade other aspects of, of what we as a community and financial services do? Okay. Michael, your thoughts? Where would you like it yeah. to be in five years and will it be there? Yeah, so, so, so from my perspective, I don't really have too many complaints in terms of where we are today. I, I, I've experienced opening up an account with a, a Revolut and some of the other challenger banks. Uh, the, the experience is, is different, uh, one more frustrating than the other. But then I'm in a position where I have a, a strong uh, footprint. 
So I, I don't hit the hurdles that others would uh, hit. What I'd like to see is the, that, that openness and, and inclusion to, to anyone who wants to do the tap tap uh, approach. Uh, and that's really what you know, I'd like to see that inclusion rather than uh, improve the experience for myself because I, I'm happy with what I get. I think we've, we've made a lot of progress in the last five years and I think in another five years it, it'll be better still and the bar will be set and it'll be you know to to those who have that footprint it'll be more than a comfortable experience. Excellent and Dan are you a, a tap tap specialist as well? Uh, I, I do advocate that, um, that that future as well. Um, I do believe that there, there will be an open data economy um, it, it started already. It's been accelerated through COVID. People want access to services digitally really, really quickly. And that's not just payment. That's proving that they are who they say they are, um, uh, being able to interact, proving that, you know, I'm over because I look very youthful as you're all going to back me up on that one. Uh, um, so proving that I am over the age of 18 when I'm buying my wine on a Friday evening from uh, from Tesco. Um, uh, all of those things um, uh, are, are being demanded by uh, but by individuals, both physically and digitally. Um, I do believe that that will be in place in five years time and either we will see a transformation of the current industry or a whole new industry um, uh, moving into um, uh, to, to, to fill that need. Okay, uh, last question. Uh, that this is a, again, uh, me summating one or two others. What steps can the present regulators take to facilitate the changes we've talked about, and how do we persuade them to take those steps? So I'll go in reverse order this time. Dan, as you were last first this time, you can be first. Uh, what really engage with private sector is the, is, is the right answer. Um, so there is there is considerable engagement um, from uh, from the FCA, for example, with the uh, regulatory sandboxes um, and uh, and so on. But engaging by engaging with the private sector um, to learn about what is possible uh, and then start to shape regulation accordingly, um, I, I, I think is paramount. It, it's not going to be possible for anybody to operate in, in, in isolation in this environment. The technology, the capability, the possibilities are all moving at lightning speed um, and the regulation needs to move at that same speed. Mike. Yeah, so, so for me, the, the, the big frustration is that from a from a uh, AML perspective is in relation to uh, transaction monitoring. So from a from a legislation and regulation point of view, you're you at the minute you're constrained to monitoring your own transactions. There isn't this uh, uh, ability or facility to get view and insights across the whole network of uh, of transactions. And I think that is uh, you know a real um, stumbling block to uh, identifying the money launderers. There are some projects going on around the globe, such as in, uh, I believe it's in the Netherlands, where banks are beginning to get together and uh, drive that um, particular uh, uh, regulation and that approach. But once again, the challenge, you know, in terms of the privacy question, the sharing of data, the insights, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big challenge. But in terms of the regulators, having a, a, an open ear and, and, and vision around those challenges from, a, uh, from an AML point of view. Thank you. And Rob? I would say that um, the regulators are uh, trying to adapt to Dan's point to unprecedented speed of change. Uh, if we look at digital identity, the subject of much of our conversation today, the JMLSG has uh, started to, I think Michael mentioned this as well, um, adapt some of its rules and regulations so it, it is better aligned with, with what you can do with the digital identity product. Um, other actors uh, such as government are setting standards and rule books. They've just responded to a private sector consultation uh, saying that they will be coming to the market and creating some form of legislative framework to make it easier for private companies to establish identity products that are privacy by design and appropriately controlled managed. We don't see what we've seen with some of the big tech. Uh, so I think there's movement in the right direction. The challenge, I think, is it, it, the organisations that are regulators haven't actually all really talked to each other in the way that maybe they should. Um, and I think that we have great people at the CMA and the, the PSR and at the FCA, 
But when I talk to them about identity, I find that they haven't talked to their colleagues about identity. So we don't have a, a national consensus, uh, Graham. We, we don't, I'm not suggesting we create a super regulator or anything like that. But we need to decide where are the leaders uh, that are going to resolve this. And that probably falls at the, law, the, 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 uh, the door of government. So we really need to see our ministers um, uh, who lead in the digital space setting policy and process. Um, I was party to a letter sent by Tech UK, 900 technology companies as members, uh, to some of the ministers recently, and they responded very positively. I think that is probably the next step for us, is to galvanise our leaders in government, Graham. Thank you. Well, uh, I apologise to those whose questions I've not been able to put. Be assured we will pass them on to the, uh, the panellists and hopefully get you some answers. In the meantime, I'd like to thank uh, the sponsors of the FS Club uh, for uh, supporting them, who have been supporting us uh, through this system. You have the list of them uh, in front of you now. I thank you very much for listening, but on behalf of those who uh, have been attending the webinar, I'd like to thank Rob, Mike and Dan for their insights today and for what they've said. It's been, uh, been fascinating that uh, we have overrun the hour as um, that's usually a good sign of, of good interaction and certainly the, the number of questions we got suggests that the, the audience has been uh, very attentive and been there. I remind you again of the, the future, the expectation, uh, and apologize again about the fact that the dates are not firm, but of course we, we do live in unfortunately these extraordinary times. Uh, thank you all for attending. Thank the, the speakers again uh, for uh, an insight, and we look forward to uh, the next webinar, which will be announced through the FS Club in due course. Thank you very much all for attending. Thanks for the invitation, Graham. Thank you. Thank you.